While 90% of professional tennis players struggle to make ends meet, one player stands alone as a beacon of wealth and prosperity. Roger Federer. But it wasn't always this way. In fact, he faced numerous struggles in his early years as a businessman. But something changed. This is how Roger Federer became the only tennis billionaire. On September 15, 2022, the tennis world bid farewell to one of its greatest players, Roger Federer, as he announced his retirement. He may have left the court, but he'll always have a special place in our hearts and his bank accounts. We mean, seriously, this guy made bank. His on-court earnings of $130 million could buy you more than 11,000 tickets to see Hamilton on Broadway. And let's not forget about his endorsements, which totaled over $870 million. We don't know about you, but we think we'd be okay with just a fraction of that. In fact, Federer's net worth is estimated to be over $1.5 billion, which means he could buy every single copy of Taylor Swift's album 1989 on vinyl and still have money left over. That's a lot of shake it off, or maybe not enough. But it's not all about the money for Federer. He's also made a huge impact off the court with his philanthropic efforts, including setting up the Roger Federer Foundation and organizing numerous charity events. He's a true class act and will miss seeing him play. There have been countless tennis players throughout history, but none have ever reached the heights of Federer's bank account. However, Roger's business game was not always a slam dunk. Back in the day, a fresh-faced Federer signed on the dotted line with Wilson Tennis at just 16 years old. He was a tennis prodigy with a bright future ahead of him. But sadly, even with his impressive skills on the court, he found himself being out-earned by his competitors. And why, you may ask? Well, it all boils down to his representation. Federer started off as a client at IMG, but his agent Bill Ryan ghosted the company in 2002 under murky circumstances. He was slow dancing in a burning room with multiple agents, and in the initial stages, it seemed like they were all going down. And this couldn't have happened at a worse time, as Federer was in the middle of negotiating a new deal with Nike. He was looking to significantly increase his current deal, which was for a measly five years and $500,000. But instead of just finding a new agent at IMG, Federer decided to leave the agency altogether and be represented by his own family, particularly his father. And to put it nicely, it wasn't a smart move. When Federer finally signed a new deal with Nike, the amount was only around $2 million annually. While that may seem like a decent chunk of change for a 21-year-old, it was far below market value. Even Andy Roddick, ranked number three at the time, was raking in more cash with his $5 million a year Lacoste contract. Yes, yes, this is rich people talk. We know it's hard to see the problem, but trust us, it's way less than he should have gotten. American tennis agent Ken Meyerson publicly called out Federer's father for the lowball Nike deal. He thought that Federer could have snagged a $10 million contract with his status. But hey, when you're being represented by your own pops, sometimes you just gotta take what you can get, right? Even when he made a name for himself, there wasn't much to his name. Honestly, imagine this. You're Roger Federer, one of the greatest tennis players of all time, but you're only making $14 million in off-court earnings in 2005. Sounds like a lot, right? But hold up. Compared to your rivals like Andre Agassi and Maria Sharapova, it's like pocket change. And that's when Roger realized that maybe he needs a better agent. We mean, come on, he's won three out of four Grand Slam titles the year before. He should be rolling in dough like a buttered croissant. When fate intervened in the form of Ted Forsman's private equity firm, it was like Federer was the protagonist in a rom-com, and IMG was this long-lost love interest that he didn't realize he missed until they were reunited. As like any good rom-com, there was a scene-stealing best friend, in this case, Monica Seles, who played the role of the wise and sassy confidant who helped Federer see the error of his ways. Once Federer was back with IMG and under the guidance of Tony Godsick, it was like he was the Beyonce of tennis, commanding top dollar for his sponsorship deals and leaving his competitors in the dust. From 2005 to 2010, Federer's annual earnings increased by an unbelievable 207% thanks to lucrative deals with Mercedes-Benz, Rolex, and Lint. Yes, he got the money and the chocolates. What in the world of Willy Wonka is this turn of fate? But it didn't stop there. Federer went on to sign a 10-year deal with Nike worth over $10 million a year, leaving other athletes green with envy. And in 2013, he made a whopping $71.5 million, proving that you can never estimate the power of a good agent. Might we say Godsick was truly Godsent? 
The same year when he surpassed Kobe Bryant to become the second highest paid athlete in the world, he was like the Hamilton of sports, with fans clamoring to see his every move and companies falling over themselves to sponsor him. It was time to level up and take his brand to the next stratosphere. So he decided to break up with IMG for the second time, but not before taking his trusted agent and business partner, Tony Gotsik, with him. Tony's really stealing the spotlight here, isn't he? He can definitely give Kris Jenner a run for her money. Together, they form Team 8, a sports agency that's small but mighty. It's got some impressive clients, including the breakout star Coco Goff and U.S. Open champ Juan Martín del Potro. And let's not forget retired NHL goalie Henrik Lundqvist. He's also part of the crew. Team 8's the perfect vehicle for Federer to establish a business around himself. Now, he works with more than 10 brands, including Wilson, NetJets, Rolex, and Mercedes-Benz. He's been working with these brands for over a decade, and their partnerships as solid as a Federer backhand. The Swiss superstar boosted his earnings by playing in exhibitions and promotional tennis events, commanding between two and three million dollars per special appearance. In 2019, he made an insane 15 million for just five exhibition matches in South America. But this wasn't all. Federer was surfing through the storms, but he wanted to up his business game, like those 20 Grand Slam titles. And what he did next would pay off in a way that no one thought it would. Federer let go of Nike. In 2018, Federer found himself at a crossroads. He'd spent more than 20 years with Nike and was ready to renew his $10 million annual sponsorship deal. However, Nike's tennis roster was stacked with talent, including Serena Williams and Rafael Nadal, and the company didn't want to overspend on athlete sponsorships. It was a classic case of to pay or not to pay. Ultimately, Nike chose to let Federer walk, and he shocked the sports world by signing a mammoth 10-year, $300 million deal with Uniqlo. It was a move that left everyone scratching their heads, wondering how a 36-year-old player entering his twilight years could command such a sum. But Federer had a plan. The Uniqlo agreement didn't include a retirement clause, meaning that even if Federer stopped playing tennis the next day, he could still earn $30 million annually in retirement. And while the deal only covered apparel, Federer continued to wear Nike shoes without receiving payment. But Federer wasn't done yet. He stumbled upon a little-known Swiss brand on running during his training and soon became a global ambassador while receiving an equity stake in the company. He helped design and market their shoes, and the company grew exponentially. Then, two years after signing the deal, On Running went public at a $10 billion valuation, and Federer's 3% stake in the business was worth a jaw-dropping $300 million. That's right, while we're all busy stressing out about our bills and student loans, Roger Federer is sitting pretty in his Swiss mansion, surrounded by stacks of cash. It's safe to say he's making his fortune work for him and for the greater good. Not only did he dominate the tennis world, but he also became the first billionaire in tennis history. And with a net worth like that, he could buy himself a lot of tennis balls. But let's be real, he probably already has enough to fill a stadium.